Hello everybody, um, good good afternoon. Um, it's so nice to see you all here. Um, thanks so much for coming to this session. Uh, this is one I'm really looking forward uh, to listening and being a small part of. Um, and just as a little reminder, this session is uh, called Being an Advocate, Working for the Sector. Um, sector bodies provide our funding and support in many cases, but what about making it your next job? Um, this session is kind of probably going to fall into two. Uh, there's going to be some questions about what it's like to work for these organisations um, and how you might want to move into a career working in them. Um, but I'm sure we'll also talk about the different uh, programmes that different organisations can offer uh, and help people at different points in their careers as well. Uh, so, without any further ado, uh, I'd really like uh, the panel to introduce themselves, um, tell us uh, what their organisation is and, and, and what it kind of does, um, just so that we're all familiar and on the same page. Um, and would you be able to start, please, Tamsin? Completely, thank you, Lucy. And hello, everybody. So I'm Tamsin Russell. I work for the Museums Association. So we are the UK wide professional body for people that work in museums, galleries and heritage, but also for those that work with. So for those individuals that might be working for suppliers or be freelancers or volunteers or anybody that has something to do with the, the, the sector. My role specifically at the MA is I lead on workforce. So I'm responsible for our professional development packages, our career advice and uh, ethics and a whole raft of other things associated with workforce. That's us. Thanks. Uh, and Liam. Uh, thanks, Lucy. Uh, yes, I'm Liam Wiseman. Um, I am a Museum Relationship Manager for Arts Council England. Um, Arts Council England is the uh, it's, it's an arms leg body um, which works across arts and cultural organisations in England. Um, arms leg body means that we get money from the government um, through, through the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, but we're not actually the government, we are a separate body. Um, and uh, we basically deliver funding and project opportunities and try to um, enhance the cultural opportunities of the country. Thanks. Uh, and Olivia. Hi, so I'm Olivia Hukin. I'm an investment manager at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So pretty similar to Liam at the Arts Council. Um, we're kind of like parallel worlds, but <laughs> we're the biggest funder of heritage um, in the UK. And um, that's anything from museums to natural heritage and um, community groups. So a little bit of everything. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so just to kind of get a flavour uh, for some of the things that have happened in your jobs, um, I wanted to ask um, you each, uh, what's the most interest, what is the most interesting thing that you've kind of done or seen um, as part of your current role? Um, and if we could start with Liam, that would be great. Sure. Okay. Um, well, I mean, so my specialty is is museums. That's kind of the the field I tend to work in the most. But one of the nice things about Arts Council is that we work um, all, all relationship managers work across a variety of different art forms. So you know, we fund museums, but we also fund theatres, um, dance groups, um, other performance venues, um, galleries, visual arts places, all sorts of things. Um, so I've been able to work across a variety of organ with a variety of organisations that I've never even Kind of either heard of before or worked with before so that's been really fascinating um and in the area that i work in in the east of england we have a specific um way of working in places as well so um we each get tasked with an area that we have a, that's an area of low engagement with arts and culture and we have a remit to work there um, across art forms again and with stakeholders like um, local authorities and councils to try and enhance the cultural um, infrastructure of the area so i've been tasked with doing that work in Fenland in Cambridgeshire. Um, and this is probably uh, probably the part of the job that I actually enjoy the most, despite despite going in thinking I was gonna be doing museum things. Um, I've actually kind of enjoyed this, this part of the role the most because it's really trying to build opportunity for people that have um, not always had easy access to cultural opportunities or funding opportunities. Um, and uh, you know these are very rural, very isolated communities. So it's a real challenge trying to kind of come in there and, and help build up um, opportunities. But that's the thing I think I've enjoyed the most. And it's, it's a challenge, but it's really, really worthwhile when you start to see 
uh, see things change, start to see some more money flowing into the area and then and then blossoming in, into different projects and different bits of work. So yeah, that's been the best thing probably. That sounds amazing. I'm from that area. So anyone who saw my face go, oh, um, yeah, more opportunities there would have definitely benefited me as a young person there. Um, but uh, Tamsin, would you be able to tell us um, what the most interesting thing you've done so far is? So uh, the, the, the reason I love working for uh, a sexual support organisation is the, the diversity of experiences that I have. So I talk to people that work in very different organisations, doing very different things, different collection types. So it's just really nice to know that there isn't a single one size fits us all in the sector. So I find that really just I'm also just genuinely nosy. So that's great um, uh, because my focus is primarily on the people side of things. I get to travel across the whole of the UK and that's amazing and seeing really good projects. So, for example, from Citizens Curator Project uh, down in Cornwall, which is around trainees and volunteers into the sector to the uh, east of England. So the Norfolk Museums uh, Service Teaching Museum. So uh, just going and seeing different people doing really good stuff. And I think, you know, professionally, whilst I've been at the MA, the thing that I'm most proud of uh, is, is the mentoring programme that I piloted, it, which was called Mentoring for All, which was an inclusive mentoring programme for anybody that worked in the sector. And that was uh, a really important step because previously, you know, it, it was primarily around organisations and individuals, but I'm going to talk about mentoring more tomorrow. But yeah, that's my highlight because... Uh, yeah, it was one of the first big things I did and it got me very much ensconced in, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. I'm based in Scotland for everybody's information. So for me, it was important to, to find out what happened outside of the nation that I'm located in. Thanks. Uh, and Olivia? Yeah, um, so the bread and butter of my job really is assessing applications for grants. Um, and I think the favourite, my favourite thing the most thing with that is when I find a really like interesting application and see it through and it gets money and then I get to kind of watch the project happen through to the end and um, I guess my most memorable project and perhaps a career highlight <laughs> is um, an application that we managed to fund for Sheffield Industrial Museums Trust where um, they removed two tons of pigeon poo from a large industrial <laughs> Bessemer converter and <laughs> I put a link in the chat because the picture of the poo is just incredible. I'm sorry, that's really unprofessional, but <laughs> that was one of my highlights, I think. I think anyone who's ever worked in museums or heritage know, knows that, that poo will always be kind of part of your professional life one way or another. <laughs> um, so moving on to kind of something a bit more serious now. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the kind of current challenges that are facing your organisation. Um, uh, and uh, would you mind starting, Tamsin? Yes, sorry, I'm having button, button issues. Uh, so uh, the biggest challenge for us is that we aren't a core funded organisation. So unlike Arts Council England or other professional networks or membership groups, uh, we don't get any core funding from government, either delivered through the Arts Council or through MGS or whatever the other funding models are. So our funding and our income comes directly from membership. So that's our biggest challenge. So what we've seen since the beginning of COVID and, and completely predictably, where people are having to make really difficult decisions about where they invest their, their money, um, we've seen a downturn in some of our individual members. We've seen an upturn in our institutional members, which is fantastic, but a downturn. So that's a, a really significant uh, challenge for us in terms of what uh, enabling us what we do we're a very small organization so we're fewer than 20 people so um yeah that, that sort of takes a hit so that's our biggest sort of organizational challenge as a as a sector body um the other challenges are just around just making sure we're meeting everybody's needs also not duplicating efforts so uh one of the things i instigated right at the beginning of covid is that uh we created a group called the UK workforce steering group but it was in response to COVID so we have 20 organisations all sector support organisations that sit around the table and meet every six to eight weeks to talk about what they're doing 
because the challenge for us was we all wanted to be doing something to help the sector but uh, you know if we're all doing exactly the same thing or we are duplicating effort or competing for audiences as it were actually that's not very sensible for the sector or for people so uh, that that was the other big challenge for us is making sure we were delivering what everyone needed, but we were also the people best placed to deliver it. We can't be everything to everybody. There are other experts that can deliver stuff. Certainly we're not a big funder like a, um, a Heritage Fund, and we don't have the same sort of uh, reach in terms of Arts Council. So that was our other challenge, is what are we going to prioritise and deliver for our members and then the sector as a whole? Thanks so much, Tamsin. Um, I wondered if you could uh, continue, please, Olivia. Yeah, um, I think a big challenge for us, I mean, leaving COVID aside, but um, something that I'm really interested in is absolutely um, kind of the diversity of our organisation is kind of a little, a little bit on the, the low side at the moment. Um, so as you can imagine, we're kind of mostly made up of white middle class women. I think it's about 70% women, 30% men. Um, and yet we still have a little gender pay gap as well, which is kind of quite interesting. Um, so I think the challenge that we're facing the most really at the moment is how to um, how to kind of deal with that and um, how to do it more quickly than we have been doing. Um, our organisation is doing an equality and diversity and inclusion review at the moment, but um, it's going to be really interesting to see what recommendations come out of that. And I kind of feel like as a major funder, we're, um, we should be more representative of the people that we not only give money to, but the organisations we support as well. So yeah, that's the bee that's in my bonnet <laughs> at the moment. It's great to hear that that work's happening though, and with, with greater urgency. Um, and Liam, what about Arts Council? Um, I think our biggest challenge probably, and you know, Heritage Fund might experience some of these challenges as well, is uh, the, the the situation of being an arm's length body is can be both a blessing and a curse. Like it is brilliant because, um, as Tamsin pointed out, you know, being a membership organisation, they're relying on their members for support. Whereas we have the government, so we have you know larger chunks of money available to us um, and more consistent, you know, usually consistent levels of funding. Um, but that can be a problem when you're in a pandemic and you're needing to respond to a million different priorities. And, and and obviously, at the moment, the Arts Council is very, very close to the government, closer than we've been in a long in a long time. And that could be really, really difficult to negotiate because a lot of the things we want to do might be against what the government wants to do or might not fit with their uh, with where their heads are at. Um, for example, with with you know colonial statues, for example, I mean, a lot of people in the Arts Council would like to really, really see some more radical uh, reinvention of the way that we talk about those histories, the way that we display those statues, um, and whether or not they should be in the public realm. We're up for that debate. We want to have that conversation, but the government does not want us to have that conversation. So um, we have that kind of challenge of uh, trying to be able to, trying to to push things in the way that we can but not piss off our biggest funders who are the government so <laughs> that can be a challenge i think challenge is an <laughs> underestimation that sounds um yeah incredibly challenging um i've got another kind of uh more serious question and then we'll talk uh, about something slightly lighter um but i wondered um how all of your organizations i know have been critical criticised and I just wondered if you could talk about how, how you cope when your organisation does come under criticism um, and would you be able to start Olivia? Yeah sure um, I mean how do I personally cope I'm actually quite excited when people criticise us constructively and um, so I mean especially with their museum jobs I think you do an amazing work of just kind of you know calling out bad practice and I think we can just learn so much from when people, um, you know, speak out. Um, we're in such a position of power with being the funder that people are often scared to talk to us and maybe say, actually, that wasn't the best thing for us. And I, I'm so much kind of, I'm so passionate about learning from the people that we support because at the end of the day, they're the people on the front lines. Um, so yeah, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm definitely pro-criticism, but I mean, on the other hand, you do often get 
um, a lot of disgruntled people so <laughs> in our job so do try and be kind to the individual on the other end of the phone at the same time <laughs> thanks olivia uh, and tamsin uh, so i love this question i thought it was a really great question so and i reflected because i wanted to get it right so first of all i am not my organization and that's something that i have to remember that's who i am i'm a museum professional Currently, I work for the Museums Association. I think I've always been critical of any organisation I've ever worked for anyway. Uh, and I think that's healthy. Uh, to be critical means you're analysing and you're looking to improve. So I am probably the Museums Association's biggest critic, but from within. Um, I also don't think it's criticism. I think it's feedback. Uh, I always talk about the gift of feedback. I think it, it, it's not, I mean, I, that sounds like, oh, I'm such a get bring it on. I do think it's hardest in, in two ways. One, I think it's really hard when the criticism is leveled at the organisation that you work for and it is something you've been trying to change. So I know I've worked for other organisations where somebody said, oh, if only they do this, and I'm like, gosh, if only you knew how much I've been trying to affect change on your behalf internally. And it is killing me that I can't do that because I completely agree with you. So I think that's um, I think that's really hard uh, around that. And then I also just think I, I'm genuinely not a very angry person. So I find sometimes, depending on my mood, um, I sometimes find criticism comes over as being conflict rather than improvement. And that's my that's my thing is I bring it on, but let's have a productive and respectful conversation. Because the reality is we probably are all on the same page but we're all adopting and approaching things differently. And my favourite, and I will stop talking in a moment, Lucy, my favourite ever Aesop's fable is where the wind and the sun are trying to get uh, a man who's walking along a road with a coat on. They're both trying to compete, try and get the man to take his coat off. And the wind says, I'm going to blow and blow and blow. I'm going to make it so cold. He's going to... Um, uh, uh, I'm going to blow his coat off. And the sun just says, well, I'm just going to sit here and do what I do and do it really well. And eventually he's going to get so hot he wants to take his coat off. And I'm always reminded of that in any sort of, uh, I suppose, conflict or tension situation is there are two ways of doing it. And uh, I'm very much the sun rather than the wind. What a metaphor. Uh, I also think the phrase, I am not my organisation, uh, is definitely one of the themes of the whole summit. Uh, Liam, how about you and, and the Arts Council? Well, I'd absolutely say that um, I agree with Tamsin about I'm not my organisation. Uh, I get really, really pissed off with a lot of the decisions that happen in our organisation. And we've even internally worked up groups to reject those ideas and challenge them and make sure that they change. So. Um, I think you're absolutely able to be part of an organization and still retain your independence and still retain your own kind of ideas. Um, but um, I think and I think this year Arts Council has come under a lot of criticism um, and it's not been necessarily because of decisions Arts Council have made, but because of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, with trying to support an entire sector, hundreds of hundreds of thousands, thousands of organizations out there that are art, artistical cultural organizations, let alone all the individuals that work in that um we never have enough money to support that you know e even in, even in the good times we've never had enough money to fund everyone and we would love to but that's just not it's never been an option for us um and so for this year when we've been trying to do that in a pandemic in extraordinary circumstances um people get personal sometimes about that people get really really upset and frustrated and rightly so because it's a shit situation but at the same time I know at the end of the day, I've, I've done what I can do. You know, I don't, I don't think I try, I don't think I go home and, and, and or not go home because I'm here all the time, um, <laughs> go and dwell on, on that too much because um, I know that we, we've done our best to try and help the people that we can. And if we have more money, we would give more money out. We would not hoard that money. We don't want to. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am with it. Uh, thanks. Liam, and I'm glad to know that the Arts Council isn't a dragon hoarding all its money. Um, that's good to know. Uh, not that I thought it in the first place. Um, so we've talked, uh, you know, a little bit about the realities of working uh, for um, representative bodies. Um, I wanted to um, ask you all, um, kind of, what route brought you 
for your role and, and why you wanted to work uh, for the bodies that you want you that you currently work for uh, so kind of what was your route to where you are now um, and could we start with you Olivia yeah of course um so I I started out doing a degree in English and there was a small module in museums and I did it and I thought, oh my gosh, I really want to be a curator now, as many, many people do. <laughs> um, so um, I did my master's in cultural heritage management and then I was like, great, now I'm definitely going to get a job. <laughs> and um, my tutor said, have you considered maybe not being a curator in a small independent museum and maybe going into something like funding where there's a few more jobs? I thought, no, no. <laughs> so I carried on. I worked in front of house quite a lot. I did a curatorial traineeship. Um, and to be honest, I found that along the way, a lot of my other skills were actually a bit more employable. And I started working for the Arts Council about five years ago. And I found that actually it's, it's really, actually really fun. Um, you, you get a bit of stability, but also you get to kind of support people going out there and doing the projects. Um, so yeah, that's just a bit about my journey here. Thanks. Uh, and how about you, Tamsin? So uh, how did I get here? So my most recent move to the Museums Association well, is that I'd volunteered with them for a long time on their professional development committee, their ethics committee. I used to run sessions and the careers hub for their conference. Uh, and a job came up uh, about six years ago that was the policy officer's job, so Alistair Brown's job. And it was based in London. I was like, oh, that looks really great. But I, one, I can't relocate to London because I'm based in Scotland. And, oh God, yeah, so I didn't apply, but I was really gutted that I didn't apply. I then was an organisation and I left the organisation without having a job to go to. And randomly, um, uh, I phoned up Charlotte Holmes, who was my predecessor, to ask her about the conference. And I said to her, oh, I'm just checking in about the conference. Do you want me to do anything this year? This is 2016. It's in Glasgow. I'm in Scotland. Do you need me at all? And she said, well, it won't be me, Tamsin. Um, I'm leaving. And I'd missed her leaving no one had communicated that she was leaving and the job was about to close the the day after I spoke to her so very very quickly I then applied so I suppose that that's just around a, a, a serendipitous approach if I hadn't phoned her on that Wednesday evening in the middle of February then I wouldn't have I would have missed it but also the really important thing is that job was still allocated and represented in London and I just asked the question could I do it from Scotland so that's something I would always advocate is, you know, if you see the dream job that you want, then apply and then have that negotiation or have that discussion. Um, I would be classed as a lateral into the sector. I used to work in private sector, I used to work for uh, Selfridges, a big department store across the UK, uh, as, as their, their person that was responsible for learning uh, and training. And the double whammy for me was that I've always loved museums from this high, and uh, a job came up at the Science Museum Group that was their head of training and development. And I thought, my God, I can help people help other people learn. And that for me, just perfect, just a perfect storm. And that's how I got into the sector. I then did a postgraduate uh, qualification at St Andrews. I felt personally it was too late for me. I joined the Science Museum Group when I was 30. And as much as I think I should have been a curator, I think that is absolutely probably more even more collections anyway let's stop talking about that for me I felt it was too late to make that sweep I mean it's not the advice I'd give anybody now god goodness me absolutely if you want to do it do it uh, so I decided I was going to carry on with my existing specialism but work in a sector that really spoke to me um, and then I improved my uh, I suppose understanding of the sector by doing a postgrad but also put my hands up to do lots of different things I sit on the accreditation committee I sit on the ethics committee recognition committee all to develop my museum practice. So I've not had what you would say even the most traditional path into the sector, but equally, I suppose it's important to note that, I mean, I still work in the sector and I still have to have really good knowledge about the sector, but my focus is still workforce. So yeah, that's my route in a slightly different one. Thanks, Tamsin. Uh, and Liam? Thanks. Um, I guess you could say I almost like fell into the profession uh, through spite, essentially, <laughs> because um, it wasn't because I particularly enjoy museums. I do enjoy museums, but it was more that I get frustrated by museums a lot of the time and I want them to be better. Um, so I, when I was at university, I did English and um, history, 
just because I didn't know what else I wanted to do and those were the things I enjoyed the most. Um, and then whilst I was doing that, I started volunteering in a museum and I was like, this is okay, it's kind of fun. It's, some days it could be pretty boring, but um, you know, there's potential to do something different here. And I felt like that was what drove me then. Um, and then so luckily, well, luckily, the year that I went to university was the year that uh, the tuition fees got whacked straight up. Um, so the government then the following year gave out a bunch of apology loans to do a master's. And that was the only way I could fund the master's essentially. And it wasn't even a loan, it was like a bursary just to do it. So um, I was quite lucky with that in a sense because otherwise I wouldn't have done that. But I did a heritage management degree um then started working uh exit to cathedral not where i would have ever thought of myself working but it was like the first job i could get and i was just like i'm just want to get my foot in the door um then i was able to get a role at, at, at stonehenge world heritage site so that was where things changed for me because that was a partnership officer role so i was managing stakeholders i was working with a variety of different people um and then ran a heritage lottery fund project at Bristol Old Vic Theatre. So I worked in like lots of different kind of heritage organizations, ended up getting this relationship manager role at Arts Council because of the variety of the experiences I had more than anything else, because obviously, you know, it's not necessary at all, but work, I think working at Arts Council, it helps if you have a breadth of experience with artistic organizations. Um, so I think that that was really useful. But yeah, I think what has carried me through my in my career has probably been spite and and this need to get me to give museums a kick up the ass sometimes. Um, and I get to do that in my job now, so I feel great about that. Uh, yeah, I can definitely uh, empathise with uh, the spite reaction to <laughs> working in the sector. Uh, oh, no, uh, public anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so we've had some questions. Um, uh, given in via Eventbrite um, and they're more about advocacy in general um, and one question that's really interesting because we've, we've touched on the idea of kind of power and responsibility but what can you do to kind of be an advocate for uh, sort of the sector that you'd like to see if you don't have power or if you feel powerless um, and uh, would you like to start with that Liam actually? Yeah, um, I think the first thing I'd say with that is I totally understand the feeling of feeling powerless, but I think it's important to remember that no matter where you are in an organisation, you do have power, you do have influence, it's the way that you look at things and the way that you use that. Um, for example, when I was, you know, in my first role as, as a development assistant at Exeter Cathedral, I was just basically doing database entry for the donors that, that, and, and, and patrons that wanted to work with us and things like that. But I, because of that, I knew all the people that were giving us money and I knew the best way to kind of, uh, to, to, to influence people through that because I could, you, you had inf a lot of information there, you know, about these people and what they, what they're interested in, what they do. So, um, I could influence the rest of the development team, um, to try and help them with us on specific projects and things like that, which would try and make the organization a bit more inclusive. So there are absolutely ways that you can do that. Um, even as a volunteer, I was pointing out all the things that were wrong and talking about everything uh, in front of house that needed to change and stuff like that. You can just do that, uh, but I think you need to have confidence. Um, but if you are in a, in a position where you feel like it's really, really difficult to do that, I think you know, what you need to do is kind of find find some allies either inside or outside the organisation that can help you make change if you're not experienced with that at all or if you, you don't feel comfort comfortable or confident with that try and find people in the sector that, that might you know, either have a bit more experience or might feel more confident about challenging things. Um, certainly, if you have issues, you can always get in touch with the Museum Relationship Manager, Arts Council or someone, um, because we, we, we don't necessarily influence museums directly, but we're always talking to museums about this stuff. So the more information we have about bad practice is actually really, really useful for us. Um, and because we, you know, Robertson says we have fun, we get to make funding decisions. So if a museum, if we, if we know a museum is is doing really poorly with its staff or having shoddy practices, that can absolutely influence our funding decisions. So um, yeah, talk to people, talk to people in the sector that will support you. Uh, I love that transparency. Thanks so much, Liam. Um, Olivia, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think never in uh, understand never underestimate the um, power of soft power. Um, 
I really like what Liam said about finding allies. And I think that's so true. If you can be in a meeting and kind of try and speak up, and then if someone else says, actually, I agree with her or I agree with him. And if you, even if you're just the person that says, I agree with that guy, um, like that's really powerful and um, a lot easier to kind of push up from below. The other thing I would say is just be kind to yourself because sometimes you're not able to change some everything you can advocate but also just you know remember you're just one person and there's a lot of problems in the world at the moment so <laughs> try and be kind thanks olivia uh, and tamsin probably echoing some but a few other bits and pieces so i do think there is something just about I've always wanted to change the world, so I'm constantly frustrated and annoyed at myself that I've not been able to do that. So there is this ridiculous burden that we put ourselves, and I think there's some really interesting things around the sector. So certainly appreciating the pace of change. So whilst you may feel you're not being influential, and I know I've not answered the question about power yet, but we can influence in everything that we do, but our sector just takes a long time to catch up the number of times I've left organizations only to find out six months later they've implemented my idea it just gives me such pain and joy in equal measure so I think there's something about appreciating pace I think there is something also about then looking for opportunities when I worked at National Museum of Scotland I've, I was sort of fairly critical of the organization for some of the things I did my ideas weren't listened to so I then joined the Scottish Museums Federation became president and that enabled me to comment on Scottish government consultations and have a much stronger voice in the sector so think about where you can utilize your power your opinions I think is really important I now adopt a very clear lobbying and coalition approach so um I know, having worked in lots of organisations, that when you're in an organisation, people often don't listen to you. They only listen to you if you're not in the organisation. So I utilise consultants, I utilise members, I utilise uh, people that I know that will be more listened to. And I have pre-meetings with them. Before the meeting, I'm going to be with them at, and we agree what they're going to say on my behalf. So I adopt really strategic uh, uh, influencing. I think other two things, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a moment, is, is just to think around, you know, that feedback to Liam, um, you, you know, depending what the situation is, because depending whether it's about influencing or whether it is around bad practice, you know, look at your whistleblowing policies, really important. Look at your grievance policies. I know who your trustees are. Um, also, if it's an ethical issue, please call us at the Museum Association, we can just talk you through what might be the issue and how we might be able to support if it's something that needs to be escalated. And then the final thing I'm going to say is just think about where you get your power from. I went to a really great workshop uh, about 12 months ago, and uh, I often feel powerless. And uh, the, the guy at the thing just said, where do you get your power from? And he then listed a whole variety of different things. You know, my technical expertise, my personality, my connections, my um, the, the fact that I am able and I'm not, I'm not dealing with a whole raft of other things. That's all factors that contribute to my power. I need to remember that, appreciate that, and then utilize that. Uh, so I think often when we talk about power, we think about grade. And actually, I just don't think that's as helpful as it needs to be. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, lots to take in from that. Um, so obviously we've been talking a lot about your organisations, but I wanted to kind of broaden it out. Um, and if you could tell us a bit more about some of the other organisations that you work with in the sector on behalf of the sector and some of kind of who your sort of key stakeholders are um, as well. Um, would you be able to start with that, Olivia? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think Liam touched on this earlier that some of our stakeholders, we've got the government, um, but we've also got the national lottery players. Um, so we're always accountable to the public, basically, and trying to be as representative of them as we can. Um, in terms of who else we work with and other advocates, I'm um, at the moment just joined the Grant Givers Movement. Um, they're an organisation that um, is trying to do what we're talking about, like um, putting people in positions of power, um, holding them to account a bit more. Um, and actually there's all sorts of organizations and Twitter accounts out there, like the Fair Museum Jobs, um, the Museum as Muck, Museum Detox. Um, yeah, there's loads out there. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. Thanks so much. Uh, and Liam? 
Um, one one thing I found really really useful is um, when working with people is and, and if you're doing a piece of work that's that's new or that you're not familiar with that you might need some help with, it's a really good idea to kind of find people that you can do sense checking with. Um, like for example, you know this work with Museum Association on on the decolonization policy that uh, or guidance that we're kind of working on. Um, we're doing a lot of talking with just anyone that has opinions on it and ideas because it's great to just try and get as much informed opinion on that as possible um, and so you can sense check it and make sure that it all feels right because it, it, there, there have been times in my career when I thought like oh I know exactly how to do this or I know the right way to do it and <clears throat> then when I've actually delivered that it's completely been wrong or not received in the correct way that I, or the way that I wanted it to so I've learned definitely it's really really good to surround yourselves with people that will happily critique, you know, positively critique your work to make sure that it can be the best it can be. And, um, but make sure that there's a good understanding, obviously, of like, if they need to be paid or something, make sure you have some, uh, some, some, some money to do that. Um, but it might, it might be friends, it might be coworkers, it might be um, other people, but that I found is, is really helpful. Thanks. Sorry, I lost the mute button there. Uh, and Tamsin. So the organisations that I work most closely with in my capacity are uh, Arts Council England, the lovely Isabel Churcher, Museums Galleries Scotland, uh, MALLS, so uh, Museums Archive Libraries Department Division, I should say in Wales, Northern Ireland Museums Council, and then in addition uh, HLF as was, and also Association of Independent Museums. So from a sector body perspective, those are the organisations I have most contact with, you know, on a not a monthly basis but every other monthly basis uh, in terms of working and then I think from an MA perspective we also have formal partnerships and that might be with a funder like Esme Fairburn uh, Foundation or it might be with our most recent one the UKRI funding so we'd have formal relationships with them and then less formal partnerships um, uh, or lower key partnerships with other sector organisations. So, for example, German Engage, when we're working on our learning manif manifesto uh, and, and others. Um, I think what's really important, and I suppose it also comes back to the power, not that I'm saying the Museums Association is powerful, but we do have a platform, is about ensuring that uh, you work collaboratively and enable as many other organisations to have a voice as, as, as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, we've not volunteers, however you describe them and for whatever purpose, have never really been a mainstay of the Museums Association's target audience, yet they're a huge part of the of the workforce population, for better or for worse, but it keeps lots of museums absolutely open. So uh, I now have a much stronger relationship with the Heritage Volunteer Steering Group. That's something that we didn't have until I joined. So I have a list of all the stakeholder groups that I participate in and whether I'm a member of their board or whether I'm a participant or whether I'm just a flag waver. Um, the one organisation I do need to flag wave for, which uh, I'm always surprised that people that don't haven't heard about them, is the Subject Specialist Network Consortia. I cannot recommend this group more highly. Who doesn't want to be uh, exposed to 40 different specialist groups around collection type? Who why not? So uh, that's the group I find that most people haven't heard of, and I'm always surprised. Big flag. Amazing. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, so I've had a couple of people message me uh, directly in the chat, which is which is really great. Uh, please do please do message with your questions. Um, and one question I think is really interesting um, is what project have you been involved in that didn't go how you hoped uh, and what did you do about it? Um, and I don't know if you've got something to start us off with, Olivia. Um, I guess the first thing to say, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all, but some projects go wrong. <laughs> and not necessarily in a bad way that I'm just seeing in the chats sharing failure exactly we learn from mistakes um, and I have to think of a specific example um, I think this is yeah okay so like I don't want to name names but it was a charity that was restoring a historic vehicle and um, they'd gone through the whole grant period and when it got to the end they said oh yes we've done all the work and then they sent me a picture and it wasn't done at all it was like half a bus <laughs> yeah. 
So um, that's, a, that's a project that sticks in my mind that goes wrong. Um, but the thing is, I think what they had done was they got really scared that we were going to be angry with them because they hadn't finished on time. So rather than tell us that, they just kind of pretended that they had, um, which actually is fraud, um, which they obviously didn't realise at all. So I think like in that situation, at first I was a bit annoyed, but then when I spoke to them and realised this, um, we were able to kind of work out, oh, okay, well, maybe you need six more months to actually finish the project. That's okay. Like you've still got enough money, um, you know, work away. We won't be angry. Like, <laughs> I think that's the main thing is if something goes wrong, tell us, tell, tell everyone. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's often not the end of the world and there's always something we can do um, to support. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and Liam? Yeah, okay, I can give an example of something that happened like fairly early on uh, when I started working at Arts Council. Um, the previous work I'd done at, the, at different organisations have been, you know, a lot of it has been with younger people, it have been youth engagement um, and, and things like that. So, uh, but when I started Arts Council, I had to take on this Finland work, which included the widest variety of people possible. And one of the things I didn't really account for, because I am... Um, uh, I am a youngish man that doesn't have kids or a family or anything like that, so I haven't really ever had to think about that stuff, um, is realise that I know nothing about how you engage families or, or uh, and, and working mums and things like that, people like that. So um, when we first started doing these kind of advice giving sessions to help people uh, apply for our funding and work with us in that, in that way, um, we were doing them like at all different times, but none of them were appropriate for um, people that have children, caregivers, people like that. So, um, and that's why I was thinking, uh, you know, I said earlier, it's so important to have a network of people with different experiences as well, because I need to check myself, you know, and realize that this isn't just about, you know, me or people in my situation that might be just working nine to five and have time to do things like that outside of that. There are so many people with different circumstances and we're trying to reach the widest possible groups of people so we need to absolutely make sure we do that so the first session that we did um we 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 didn't have that many people turn up and we're like well why was it you know we have a lot of people interested um but then we got feedback saying the time just what doesn't work for us you know this isn't really appropriate um and from then we kind of figured out what the best time would be and and you did that and and that is great because now we've got it you know we've not got it right it still doesn't work for everyone but it's as good as it you know it's the best that it can kind of be so um I think yeah when, when you're doing work with, with projects that are trying to engage a lot of different people you have to make sure you understand their circumstances as well yeah absolutely getting getting the timing right is so key but yeah so overlooked at Tamsin uh so I always think all of my projects could be better so pretty much every, all of them have been a failure as far as I'm concerned um uh, most of my projects have been delivered though but they're, they're often not to time so other things pace of change other priorities uh, uh have meant that they've been delivered but have, have been delayed which is i can actually i can easily i can cope with that to be honest because i think lots of things are delayed so do you know what as long as no one's going to die if a museum project from my perspective is a tiny bit delayed, i'm sure uh heritage lost your are thinking oh my goodness everything has to be done on time but i'm just sort of quite in the projects i run I, i'm I, i'm a little bit fluid about about it and i accept that there will be things that that mean it might be delayed the example i can think about though is i joined an organization and they were behind on a project and they asked me to come up with a really significant program of work of of a number of projects that sat under it. So it was a really complex bit. And they wanted me to do it all and write it all and get it signed off with a big program initiation document within four weeks. And I was so eager to please, I said yes. And I show shouldn't have done because I had no idea around the complexity of that organization, its pace of change or the angst that organization was going through. So uh, first of all, uh, I, I misread the organization. I also was overly ambitious because I thought they'd all be up for it. And they weren't and then the other thing was they got to a point for one of the strands was around continuous improvement which is something i love and um i was being told that i hadn't spent my budget which is really unusual because usually i have such a little budget i spend it right within a day but in this particular situation i uh hadn't spent my budget it was getting to the year end and they were like you have to spend your budget so i ordered and they still haunt me I'm, they're probably still gathering dust in this organization 150 books 
that were going to support the rollout of improvement methodology in this organization. And I guarantee they're just still sitting there because even by the time I finished my fixed term contract, the organization was nowhere near wanting to adopt an improvement methodology. Uh, and so for me, that's the word, and I do still think about it to this day, that's the, the, the project that I'm least, I'm least happy about because, uh, and I was forced to behave in a way that I knew wasn't right, but that I just couldn't stop it. So yeah, oh God, those books. Yeah, trying to stay true to your values can be so hard, definitely. Um, we've had another interesting question um, that is um, coming from someone who, who is thinking about working or applying for jobs with a, a sector body like yourselves. I think that's where they might be in the sector. Um, where do, question one is, where do you find the jobs? Where are jobs that your organisations posted? And also, what's the one thing that they could maybe go away and do today that might kind of help them uh, along that path? Um, and uh, Olivia, would you mind starting? Yeah, um, in terms of finding jobs, I think um, there's Leicester Museum jobs. I think that's an amazing starting point. Um, the Museums Association, Museums Journal, um, arts jobs. Um, if you kind of are really keen in a specific area, um, just bookmark loads of organisations, websites, and just check their jobs every now and then, um, I'd say. Um, in, and then what can you do to kind of go away and if you want to kind of get into what we do, um, I would say um, have a think about skills that you've picked up, not necessarily in the sector as well. Um, so I absolutely think that my year in between my degree and my master's where I just worked in a shop was probably the most valuable one for me in terms of kind of getting the next step up. Um, so and, and I think that even more so now when we're kind of thinking about you know people having a more an unusual kind of um steps into the sector i think it's going to be even more valued as we go along um so yeah and don't don't undersell yourself um if you're if you're unsure just kind of do a little um um mind map on a piece of paper and write down all the little things that you think are good and they'll actually be really big things Uh, and Tamsin, please. Uh, so I would use your network and use your network's network. So um, uh, to find out about whether any jobs are coming up as well as everything that Olivia said. I also think that's what's really helpful. It's just actually telling people you want to go and work for their organisation. You know, telling people out loud what you want and what your career aspirations are means that um, they might have you in mind they should still offer obviously operate good open recruitment policies but they might have you in mind um and uh i think certainly you know if you want to know how the museums association works or doesn't work you know apply to be a trustee apply to be um a, 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 an ma rep uh, volunteer at our conference and get free conference whatever it might be is get to see what the organization is is like because i do think you know when i was on this side working in a museum looking at a sector support organization i just wasn't really sure what they did um uh, and i thought it was way more glamorous than it was people is all i'm going to say it really isn't glamorous uh, so yeah just just find out what they do and 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 highlight that you're interested in working for them is what i'd say thanks Tamsin and liam Thanks. I, I just say, I think um, both of those, Olivia and Tamsin have hit the nail on the head with that. I think uh, Olivia's point about using different experience that's not necessarily museum experience is really useful, like, especially for sector bodies. I think so much of our jobs are about communication with people. So for, for the role I did here, you know, I, I, could, I could use several different experiences of different kind of heritage jobs that I'd had. But I also talked about the fact that when I was at university, I used to work in a bar as well. So I'm like, I could talk to all sorts of people, especially when they're pissed. So um, you know, being able to demonstrate those kind of skills, I think, is also useful. Um, and with with uh, Tamsin's point, I can't remember what I was going to say about that, um, but she said something really good and I wanted to follow on from it. Um, no, sorry, I've forgotten. Um, but uh, was it maybe about networks. Don't worry, really, Liam, I've got yeah. another question and if and let okay. it come to you and then yeah. we can yeah end on a high note. Um, so um, my uh, next question is we've talked about how you kind of advocate uh, as part of your job, but how can kind of or can kind of workers within the sector um, kind of what can they do to help you out um, or what would you appreciate us doing? 
uh, and uh, Liam, we'll go to you. Um, oh, what, what can people do to help our organisations out? Um, I think, I think uh, as has been mentioned before already, um, people having having patience and understanding with us. Um, it is it it can seem incredibly frustrating when someone applies for one of our um, grants or something like that and gets rejected, and that's partly because our our grant feedback is not particularly helpful. I, I'll be the first person to say that. But um, people a lot often often get very frustrated and complain about things and say, you know, this isn't fair. This isn't what should have happened. But often they don't understand the things that we're looking for in the first place. Um, so I think if you're going to, you know, want to use a sector body in the best way, really try and drill down what it is that we do, and what we're looking for when we either when you either want to work with us or work for us as well. You know, when you're looking at job applications as well, um, because you don't want to end up writing an application or even worse, going into an interview and not really knowing what the organisation does or, or what or what we're after. So, um, yeah, to kind of help us and help yourselves know what we do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I saw some uh, emphatic nodding, Olivia, so if you wouldn't mind coming in. Yeah, sure. I think I was just thinking in my head, please don't shout at us. <laughs> like, I mean, we even sometimes you could, it's frustrating for us too if we see a good project and we're not able to fund it. Um, so sometimes we're just as kind of, well, maybe not just as disappointed, but if we're giving difficult feedback, it can be a challenge. Um, to be honest, most people don't shout at us, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and the other thing I was going to say um, is the thing you can do to help us is call us out, like we were saying earlier. Um, you know, I think the only way we can change the organisations that we work for is if more people tell us when we do things that maybe we shouldn't or could do better. Um, so yeah, um, we'll work on having our feelers out there and then you can kind of tell us and we'll be like, oh yes, maybe we should change, so yeah. That'd be very helpful. Great, and Tamsin. So I think that challenge is exactly right, but, but also just ask us. So if there's something you need or want, or there's something missing, it could well be that either we've got it in the pipeline and we've not thought about it, and if it's really urgent, we can bring it forward, or it could be we've just not thought about it. So I, you know, tell me what to do and I will do it, especially now we're working digitally and we're not responsible, you know, relying on print media the whole time people can be far more responsive so just let us know how we can help you because we genuinely do want to help you uh i think uh you know tag us instagram twitter raise our profile say thank you all of those things and of course currently membership body we currently have a 20 percent uh, offer until the 16th of december please join the organization for less than three pounds a month i think it was that's it i would be told off if i didn't say that now. no well done Thank you. <laughs> um, and kind of, we're almost at time and I think I could talk for a lot longer, but um, we all have lives and probably other Zoom meetings to get to. But I just wanted to end on a final note um, and ask you what's coming up for your organisation uh, that you're excited about working on? Um, and uh, Olivia, would you like to go again? Yeah, one well, thing, this is going to sound quite dry, but I am so excited. <laughs> one thing we're working on at the moment is um, new forms, and it, it's going to be so good. <laughs> It'll be better for everyone, us, you. Um, so um, hopefully we're going to have a new system um, maybe by mid next year. Um, so watch this space. It's going to be hopefully a lot easier to apply. Um, yeah, <laughs> very exciting. That is exciting. Uh, Tamsin. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about is uh, our anti-racism plan has gone to our board. So we've got a really clear uh, idea about what that might look like uh, uh, in terms of, you know, workshops around activism, potentially workshops about al al allyship. So I'm most excited about that because it's something uh, that is timely and, you know, the right thing to do. And to be involved with that is just awesome. Can't wait. Thanks, Tamsin. And Liam? Yeah, um, some people may know if they're, if they're at all dialed into Arts Council stuff, that at the start of the year, we launched a, a new 10-year strategy, Let's Create, 
which we were planning to do loads of stuff around this year, but obviously COVID happened and everything went out of the window. Um, but next year, we're going to hopefully, you know, properly start that. So we'll be launching the delivery plan, which will explain how we're going to about go, going to go about enacting some of the changes we want to see in the sector. Um, and we'll get to start to kind of get our teeth into that and, and start talking to people about the possibilities again, which is, which is again, one of the parts of the job that I love the most is actually helping people talk to them about their ideas and, and support them through that process. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Oh, that does sound exciting. And the idea of possibilities, whether that's, uh, yeah, activism and training or a new application form or a whole new programme, I think is something that we all we're all desperately looking for. Um, I would really like to thank all of our speakers. I'd love to thank Tamsin and Olivia and Liam. Um, it's been really interesting and informative for me. Um, and I really hope it has been uh, for everybody uh, in the audience. Um, so I'll say a big thank you. Uh, we can share lots of the links after the session and this session was recorded as well. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have pleasant evenings, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.